Good day, everyone. Welcome to our next session on 21st century literature. This time, we will be discussing the different approaches to literature, especially literary criticisms. It is important that in order to understand and appreciate the literary text that we are going to read, it is important that we get familiar with the various critical approaches to literature. And these are the lenses. Okay, we call them lenses in literature. For our session learning targets, at the end of this session, we will be able to distinguish the various literary criticism approaches. Secondly, I want you to write a close analysis or a critical interpretation of the text um, in terms of its form and theme and with a description of its context derived from research. And lastly, you will be able to identify representative texts and authors from Asia and Africa. When we say critical approaches, these are the lenses that we are using in order to analyze a particular text. These are the perspectives that we consider in analyzing or interpreting a text. Now, why are we using critical approaches? Why are we using these lenses? It helps us interpret the text um, using the following questions. Number one is, what do we read? Okay, it refers to the context or the content of the text. Why do we read? It refers to our motives, intentions. Why are we reading such particular text? And lastly, how do we read? What are the way or what are the man what is the manner by which we understood the text? How did we interpret the text? How did we arrive at a certain meaning of a text? Okay, so that is, those are the questions that literary criticism can help us answer. Now, the important literary criticisms that we should know are the following. Formalist criticism, biographical criticism, new historicist criticism, psychological or psychoanalytic criticism, deconstructionist Reader's response criticism, sociological criticism, which can still be divided into two, Marxist criticism, and feminist criticism. We have gender criticism as well, and post-colonial criticism. Let's start with the formalist criticism. When we say formalist criticism, it believes that the meaning of a text can only be derived from the elements and devices that created it, okay? So it holds true meaning um, when the literary elements interact with each other, when the literary devices are employed in the text, okay? They work together to form a whole. So that's what formalist critics believe, that any text can only be defined, can only be interpreted using the literary text, using the literary elements that the text has employed. Formalist criticism further um, uses the following in order, in order to interpret the text. Literary elements, how each element of the work relates to the work as a whole, to the literary devices, how the devices function to create meaning. When it comes to structure, how the text is structured, how the text is organized, that is also part of formalist criticism. And of course, the language of the literary text or the style of writing will also fall under the formalist criticism. Okay, so when we analyze a text using the formalist criticism, we analyze it according to the literary elements, according to the literary devices, according to the formative according to the formal structure of the text. Okay, so that is what we call formalist criticism. 
biographical criticism revolves around analyzing the life and background of the author when it comes to analyzing the text. Okay, so what may have influenced him or her in writing the text? What are his or her personal principles or beliefs that may affect him or her in writing the text? That will fall under biographical criticism. The new historicist approach is a modern literary criticism that takes into account the history or the time period when the literature or when the literary text was created. So it focuses more on how the events in the history contributed to the literary text as well as the ideologies in that particular history, the, the power struggle in that particular history, the beliefs in that particular history is part of the new historicist criticism. The next literary criticism is what we call psychological or psychoanalytic criticism. Now, this literary criticism is influenced by the works of Sigmund Freud, an Austrian psychologist, um, an Austrian psychoanalyst. Um, he uses psychoanalyst, psychoanalytic methods in treating his patients. Um, he tries to talk with them, try to unravel the hidden desires and interests and fears suppressed memories, suppressed desires of his patients. Now, putting that context in literature, if we want to analyze a text using psychological or psychoanalytic criticism, we look at the motives or intentions of the characters, why they behave the way they do in the story. Okay, So that mirrors the personality of the author himself or herself, that may also reflect his or her personality and his or her mind as a whole, okay? So when we analyze a text using psychoanalytic or psychological criticism, we look at the motives, the hidden desires or interests of the characters. Um, their manner of behavior may also be put into consideration when we use psychological, psychological or psychoanalytic criticism. Now, symbolisms may also play a vital role in how we analyze a text using this particular lens because the symbols in the story or in the text may also give you a reflection of how the personality works, how the personality of the author or how the personality of the character works, okay? So, you may also look for symbols when we talk of psychological, psychoanalytic. Um, criticism. Now, what are the two tenets of psychological or psychoanalytic criticism? Number one is it views characters in literature as a reflection of the author himself or herself. So that's what I already told you a while ago. And number two, in order to achieve number one, is we have to conduct an in-depth analysis of the characters in order to understand the ulterior motives of those characters. So when we say in-depth um, character analysis, we'll look at how he thinks, how what he says, how he does things in the story. That would also be part of an in-depth character analysis in order to reveal the personality of the character that may also mirror the personality of the author of the story. Okay? The next criticism is what we call deconstructionist criticism. This is also one of the modern literary critics criticisms that um, that have risen. Okay, um, deconstructionist critics believe that um, there is no single meaning of any word. Therefore, the text itself may have multiple meanings also. Okay, so that's what deconstructionist criticism. Um, believes all texts, all literary texts have multiple and valid meanings because readers will interpret them differently than the writer intended them to do. Okay, so that is what we call deconstructionist. 
Now, deconstructionism or deconstructionist criticism is um, further employed or it is firstly introduced by Jacques Derrida. Um, he is a French philosopher. Derrida um, was the one who coined the term deconstruction. Okay? He argues that in Western culture, um, people tend to think and express their thoughts in binary oppositions. For example, black or white, um, good and evil, love and hate, life and death. Okay, so um, Jacques Derrida believed that in order to interpret the text, we may also look at how words or how the syntax is employed in the text, such as finding these binary oppositions that make the theme or that comprise the theme or motif of the text. Okay, so we look at the connotations, denotations of the words used in the text that may reveal the theme or the motif of the text. Now, binary oppositions, according to Jacques Derrida, um, believe, um, refer to two um, opposite words. One is being superior towards another. That is what we call, um, that is how Jacques Derrida described binary oppositions. The one, one word is more superior than the other, and that may also reflect, uh, that may also be reflected in the literary text, which um, may form as the motive or the theme of the text based on the, op based on the binary oppositions that you will identify in the text using the deconstructionist criticism. The next criticism that we will have is reader's response criticism. So from the word itself, it depends on the readers. Okay? It puts premium on the importance of the readers in arriving at a, a certain meaning of the text. Okay? It, it, it depends upon the reader's response to the text. Okay? Now, what are the important tenets? What are the important tenets of reader's response criticism? Number one, it focuses on the act of reading and how it affects reader's perceptions of a text. Okay, so um, basically, it talks about the reader. It's more on an extrinsic factor because it depends on the reader. Um, it depends on his or her reading situation the circumstance, okay, that may also affect his or her response to the text. The second one is reader's response criticism views literary text as an experience more than just an object, okay? So any given text is more than just an object to be interpreted. Instead, it is a reading experience based on reader's response criticism, okay? So, it depends on the reader, it depends on his or her reading situation, and it depends also on his or her personal experiences that he brings to the text as he interacts with the text. That's why it's a reading experience, not just an object of interpretation. Lastly, reader's, reader's response criticism um, believes that the text is a living thing that exists in the reader's imagination. So it really depends on the reader's um, response to the text. That's why it's called reader's response criticism. Okay, what else? Different readers from different time periods will have different interpretations of the same text that will fall under reader's response criticism. Okay, we also believe that each of us as readers have different experiences that we bring to the text that may also affect the way we respond to the text. That is also what we call reader's response criticism. The next criticism that we will have is sociological criticism. Okay, sociological from the word sociology, society, social, it revolves around the, how society affects the literature, the literary text. Okay? So it focuses on the beliefs and values of a society and how they are reflected in a text. Okay? Another thing is that it stresses on the economic, 
political and cultural issues within a literary text. Lastly, so sociological criticism views literature as a reflection of society that created it. Okay, so that's more of sociological criticism. Now, sociological criticism, since it talks about social issues, um, some other literary criticisms have, are, can be um, extracted from this, and that is what we call sociological Marxist. Okay, so when we say Marxist criticism, it talks about the power struggle, the class struggle, because it, 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 it touches more on the issues of power, politics, and money. Okay, so these elements, these three elements, power, politics, and money, play a role in how the text is interpreted. Okay, so how the, how the position of power, how politics, how the money um, impact the society and the characters as well in the text. Okay, that will fall under Mar Marxist criticism. There is always a class struggle between the rich and the poor, between the less superior and the more superior. Okay, so those are elements of Marxist approach in literature. The other one is what we call sociological feminist criticism. Okay, so sociological feminist because, again, um, women are more judged um there there is a what do you call this there is a major huge difference between men and women and society and that uh, particular conflict between men and women gave birth to feminist criticism okay uh, feminist criticism focuses on the roles positions and influences of women within the literary text it may also be about how women authors portray women characters in the text and how male authors um, empower women characters in their literary texts. That may also fall under feminist criticism. Okay? Feminist criticism also um, talks about, also destroys the concept of patriarchy in society. Okay? Um, uh, basically, um, in since time immemorial societies are primarily patriarchal when we say primarily patriarchal patriarchal um it's basically led by men okay the 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 positions in government are more um led by men more than women so that's why feminist approach feminist criticism um was born because of those issues okay what else? Um, now that patriarchal patriarchy is prevalent in society, it also pervades literature. So it also dominates literature. So literature is more dominated by men authors. So it gave rise to feminist criticism as well. Now, what are the things that we have to question ourselves? when we use feminist approach in analyzing a text. Number one is, how is the relationship between men and women portrayed? Okay, how are the male characters and female characters interact in the text? And how are they, how is their relationship portrayed in the text? Another thing that you can ask yourself is, what are the power relationships between men and women or characters assuming male and female roles? So when we say power relationships, which one, who are the more dominant, who are the more submissive when it comes to the characters in the story? Or which characters assume male roles and which characters assume female roles? So you may also discuss that when you use the feminist approach to literature. Another thing is how are male and female roles defined? Do they break the stereotypes in the given by the society? If that's the case, then that you can use feminist approach. 
what constitutes masculinity and femininity. So you may also explore the concepts of masculinity between and among the characters in the story or the concept of femininity between and among the characters in the story. How do characters embody these masculine and feminine traits? Do they exemplify it well? Do they exemplify it um, not excellently? So those are parts of feminist approach to literature. Also, do characters take on traits from opposite genders? So do you have male characters who assume feminine roles, who assume feminine traits? That will also be part of analyzing the text using the feminist criticism. And how so? How do these um, interchange of roles um, impact you as a reader or impact each other's, impact the characters in the story, impact the interaction of the characters in the story? Okay, so that may also be part of the feminist criticism. Now, the next literary criticism that we will have is the gender criticism and queer theory. Um, it is also an offshoot of feminist movement, of feminist criticism, since we, um, we are also um, still led by a patriarchal society. Um, the gender roles are assigned according to the society, according to how society views gender roles. At the same, therefore, the multifaceted um, concept of gender is suppressed. It's most, of, it's most of the time suppressed or hidden because of fear of rejection or discrimination by society. So that is why gender criticism or queer theory was born. Um, it is an extension of feminist movement but it puts premium, it puts emphasis on the struggles of members of the LGBTQ+, plus, and it also focuses on the concept of gender and sexuality, that it is multifaceted, that it can be flexible, okay? Um, gender criticism believes that... Um, Power is not just patriarchal, a man dominating a woman, that's not the case of patriarchal. It also suggests that power is multifaceted and never in one direction. Okay, so that is what we call gender criticism or queer theory. Now, what are the things that we need to ask ourselves when we analyze a text using the gender criticism or queer theory? Number one is, what elements of the text can be perceived as being masculine and feminine? And how do the characters support these traditional world roles? Remember that gender criticism also focuses on the gender roles assigned by society. So it somehow relates to feminist criticism. Okay, so you have to identify first which roles are more active and dominant and which roles in the story are more passive and marginalized. Okay, so that is what we call a um, power relationship in the gender criticism. Another thing that you can ask yourself is what sort of support, if any, is given to the elements or characters who question the masculine or feminine binary or those who are bisexual, those who assume um, both roles okay do the characters do the other characters or do the text itself offer support to those characters who assume both roles okay so that will fall under gender criticism another is what elements in the text exist in the middle between the perceived masculine and feminine binaries okay so those who are um those characters who assume both feminine and masculine gender, both roles, um, are, are there any elements in the text that provide that? So that will fall under gender criticism or queer theory. 
Another question that you can ask yourself is, what are the politics or ideological agendas of specific gay, lesbian, or queer works, and how are those politics revealed in the work's thematic content or portrayals of its characters? So in order to utilize a gender criticism approach, you have to identify first um, if the genre of a text is more queer because you can utilize this criticism better if the text employs gender um, fluid or LGBTQ characters or if the author is a member of LGBTQ that would also be part of gender criticism um, approach. Another thing you can also ask yourself is what are the poetics or literary devices and strategies of a specific lesbian, gay, or queer works? So, yun nga, um, you have to identify genres muna of LGBTQ literature. And from there, you have to pick out or you have to extract or identify specific literary devices or strategies that these works have in common. Also, you can ask yourself, what does the work contribute to our knowledge of queer, gay, or lesbian experience and history or literary history? So how does the text improve your impression, improve your experience as a person who interacts with other people who may be members of LGBTQ community? So that will also fall under gender criticism. The next criticism that we will have is post-colonial criticism. Post-colonial or post-modernism, um, it's also one of the modern um, literary approaches that literary critics are using. Post-colonial critics are concerned with literature produced by colonial powers and works produced by those who are or who were colonized. Okay, so Post-colonial criticism um, emphasizes the texts that are produced by countries who are colonized by other countries because these texts may also talk about colon colonization. This may, the text may also talk about double identity or hybridity. When we say double identity or hybridity, um, you as a person who come from that country who is born in that country, who and your country is colonized by another country, you are able to adapt to, to both cultures, to both beliefs and traditions. That's why you find it hard to identify yourself as this one who is born in the country or this one who is, coloni who is colonized by the other country. So that will fall under post-colonial criticisms, okay? Um, it talks about themes or conflicts that um, colonize and colonizer relationship. So it also focuses on how the colonizer colonized the colonized, uh, sorry, um, it focuses on how the colonizer um, colonize a specific country and how how the colonization affects the identity of that country okay that will fall under post-colonial criticism so how do we approach a text using post-colonialism Number one is, how does the literary text explicitly or allegorically represent various aspects of colonial oppression? Okay, so um, you may explore the concept of colonization in the text, how the, colonier, how the colonizers oppress the, rest, the citizens of the colonized. Okay, um, is there any event in the story that may reflect um, that may reflect the cult the colonization oppression, colonial oppression, okay? Another thing you can also ask yourself is what does the text reveal about the problematics of post-colonial identity, including the, including the relationship between 
personal and cultural identity, such issues as double consciousness and hybridity. This is what I'm talking about. For example, we as Filipinos, we were colonized by different colonizers. And when we talk of personal identity, yes, we can say, we can easily say that we are Filipino, but we are also a mix um, culture of Japanese, American, Spanish, right? So our identity as a Filipino is already blurred because we do not have a solid identity of a Filipino because we were colonized by different colonizers. That is what we call having hybridity. That is what we call experiencing hybridity. Um, we embrace both cultures. We embrace multiple cultures because we were colonized by multiple colonizers. Okay, so that's what we call post-colonial criticism. Um, it talks on the identity of the characters, um, how they are how they are coping with such problems with the identity because they are colonized by other countries that will fall under post-colonial criticism. Another thing you can ask yourself is what person or persons or groups um, does the work identify as other or stranger? How are such persons treated? Um, when we say othering, um, we try to isolate or we try to alienate other people because of their cultures, traditions. Okay, so for example, um, a foreigner would come into the Philippines and uh, that foreigner would experience alienation or othering wherein we Filipinos do not um, interact with him, we do not consider him as a visitor, we reject his or her um, cultures or traditions or norms, therefore alienating him. So does the text have those elements? Because if yes, you can use post-colonial criticism. Now, um, all these criticisms may be employed um, or they may be integrated with one another when you analyze a text, okay? Just because we discuss them separately does not mean we can also use them separately. Most of the time, one criticism may overlap with the other principles of other criticism. For example, if I will um, use Marxist criticism in analyzing Noli Metangere, most probably, I will also be touching the principle of sociological criticism, historical criticism, feminist criticism. So um, once we analyze a text using literary criticism approaches, it does not mean that we can only stick to one criticism. Because most probably, you will be touching aspects of other literary criticisms that may, be, that may also be helpful in understanding, analyzing, and appreciating the text that you are reading. Okay, so those literary criticisms may be, integra may be integrated, okay? You do not just stick to one criticism in analyzing the text, okay? Also, it helps to know that when we analyze a text, we try to analyze the text from multiple angles, from multiple lenses, and that may also signify that we may have to use varied multiple literary criticism approaches in order to further understand and interpret and appreciate the text. Okay, so I hope you learned something today. I hope that we, we will be able to apply all these literary criticism approaches to the text that I will going to um, give to you we will be exploring literary texts from Asia and Africa first, and then we move to North America and Latin America, and then proceed with Europe at the end of our semester. So thank you for listening, and um, have a great day, everyone.